Hi there. This is the, uh, uh, the Canal Arbitragem uh, arbit uh, Arbitration Channel. And uh, this is part of our program, Think Tank Hard Talk. And uh, uh, today we are going to interview uh, Gabriel kaufmann -Kuller. Uh, Gabriel kaufmann Kohler uh, is uh, honorary president of um, I, uh, of ICA, the International Council for Commercial Arbitration. She um, practices international, commercial, investment, and sports arbitration. And uh, Gabriel uh, appears on numerous institutional arbitration panels. Uh, like ICC, ICSEED, uh, AAA, LCAA, CIAC, and CIATAC. She's a, a professor emerita at uh, Geneva University Law School and honorary president of the Swiss Arbitration Association. And I have three or four pages of her curricula and uh, curriculum, and I'm not going to read this. Uh, Gabriel, this is only to introduce you to our young practitioners and to uh, our uh, students. It's a real pleasure to have you uh, in order to record this uh, interview. And uh, the, the program, you know, is um, uh, the, ob the objective of this program is to make some questions in order to give to our students and to our young uh, practitioners an idea of uh, who is who in the world of arbitration and who is who, uh, who is important in the world of arbitration. So, uh, first of all, let's start with uh, Fabiana and uh, to make some questions. Thank you, Professor Carmona. Um, Professor Gabriel, first of all, thank you so much for here for being here with us. It's an amazing honor for us and for all the Brazilian arbitration community to hear you and to learn from you. So, uh, first of all, we would like really like to know when and how did you start working with arbitration? Maybe before I answer this, should I say that I'm very happy uh, to be at least virtually in Brazil today. Uh, it would be much nicer to be there in real, but, uh, but that's not the times we live in now. So uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, I did a PhD in private international law many, many years ago. And that was uh, a, that I liked anything that was linked to different countries and was open to the world. And then when I got to practicing and asked myself, well, where, where can I do something that is international? And, and arbitration looked like a, a good candidate for that. And so when I was, I went for two years to New York, that was 1988, 81. And my first arbitration I worked on was at 81. So it's 40 years ago. So I, I feel very, very, very old. Uh, but uh, I asked when I was in this firm as a foreign associate whether I could work on arbitration. And I was allowed to work on my first arbitration. And that is when, when I started. And I learned a lot uh, during these times. And I liked it very much. So when I came back to Switzerland, uh, later I, I try to develop uh, arbitration work. So that's how it started. That's amazing. And uh, there was, from, from then until now, there was a lot of development and growth. And there is a study of investment arbitration released in 2016 that concluded that you were the most influential arbitrator in the world. So uh, we would really like to know how did you enter the investment arbitration world and what do you enjoy most about working in international arbitration? Yeah, uh, I think it was, it must have been early 2000s when I was put on the arbitrator list of the World Bank chairman. There are there investment arbitrators that are designated by states, parties to the exit convention, and there's a, a, a special list uh, that is uh, drawn up by the chairman. And I was lucky enough uh, to uh, get put on this list. And then I was also lucky that uh, two more senior arbitrators uh, were bold enough or maybe supportive enough 
to choose me as as president of the arbitral tribunal. This was Caroline Spockstiegel and Bernardo Crevades. And so that was my first uh, investment arbitration. It was, I remember it vividly, it was Aucoven, Autopistas Consolidadas de Venezuela against Venezuela. And so, uh, so that is how it started. And I liked it very much. It was tough because I was chairing uh, and it was my first investment arbitration was to senior arbitrators much more experienced than I was, but they were nice to me and I did my best. And then the, the other appointments followed afterwards. So, yeah, that's the start. I think you, you asked another question after that, didn't you? Uh, what do you enjoy most about working in international arbitration? Yeah, that's a good question. There's many things I like in international arbitration. I already said that I liked what is open to the world where I can learn about other countries and other cultures. It's very diverse because every arbitration is, is like a story that is told to me, right? Where uh, was different cast of characters, was a different economic sector, was specific facts, was certain legal issues. So I like this very much. I like the transnational culture of international arbitration where you mix people from different backgrounds. What else do I like? I like, as an arbitrator, I like sharing a lot because it, it is, well, you have to resolve the disputes in terms of facts and law, but you also have to manage the process and you have to manage the people. You have to manage uh, counsel, witnesses, experts, and then you also have to manage the tribunal. And that is often behind the scenes and people don't see it, but it's it's part of, it's also part of the, of the work. So all of this is a very mixed type of uh, activity that I enjoy very much. Thank you. It's very nice to hear this from you and I relate to it, so it's really nice. And Professor, my last question in this topic would be, uh, do you recall any arbitration that made a particular impression on you or had a marked effect on your career besides the, the first one uh, or maybe even that one? Yeah, there, there are so many, so it's difficult to single out. Uh, and of course, they all add up to uh, to my experience. But it's true that the first investment arbitration remains uh, an important one for me uh, because I, I somehow discovered a whole new world. It was very different from commercial arbitration, not the technique. The techniques are, are, are disputes resolution. They're the same largely, but this was a different game because I suppose mainly because of the public interest that is involved and that gives a different flavor uh, to the dispute settlement. So that uh, was really a discovery for me and I enjoyed it very much. Gabriel, uh, you were uh, talking about uh, culture in arbitration, and this is something that you, you like uh, most in arbitration. But uh, dealing with different cultures is something very, very difficult in, uh, in commercial arbitration, especially in commercial arbitration, isn't it? Uh, I'm asking this question because we are Brazilian and we are very friendly, informal, and uh, well, you, you know, because you know Brazil, you know us. Uh, Brazilians. Um, is this disturbing for international arbitration and for commercial arbitration, for instance, dealing with this Brazilian culture, for instance? No, no, it, it isn't. I have had uh, some uh, international arbitrations in Brazil and uh, it was not disturbing at all. It was quite uh, pleasant, I would say. I mean, the work is always hard, right? And you have to work and you have to understand the facts and you have to understand the law. But uh, the uh, this friendly environment, that friendly atmosphere uh, makes things easier. And when I chair, I always try to make sure that uh, the uh, the atmosphere is, is friendly and nice because uh, sometimes it can be very aggressive and 
depending on how you share, you can kind of uh, uh, neutralize the aggressions. And then it becomes easier. It, it's easier for the tribunal because you, you focus on the issues and not on all kinds of uh, side battles. And I think it's nicer for, for counsel as well because they can also focus on what is important. So uh, to me, when at the end of the hearing, I have a feeling like everyone uh, has the feeling that they were heard. Well, someone may well lose, right? Uh, sometimes both lose, but sometimes uh, one loses. But uh, the fact that at the hearing, they got the feeling that they were treated fairly, to me, that's very important. And that's part also of this whole uh, more friendly, cooperative uh, uh, way of handling uh, proceedings. Good, thank you. And uh, now uh, Sergio is going to ask some questions about arbitration in Brazil. Sergio. Thank you, Carmona. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Professor Gabrielli, for being with us today. It's such an honor to interview you and to learn from you and your large experience. So the questions that I have is related to arbitration in Brazil. And the first one that I, that I would say is, if you had an opportunity of participating in arbitrations involving Brazilian parties or Brazilian law, which uh, you already answered. So my question would be, what, 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 the, what was the experience that you had uh, working in this case? Uh, it was, I mean, it involved, it was two international commercial arbitrations, was in part Brazilian parties, uh, Brazilian council, uh, arbitrators, uh, a lot of people in the room. Uh, I, in the end, frankly, it was not that different from an arbitration proceedings in Paris or in London or in Singapore or, or in New York, because we, we by now have, a, 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 and I think everywhere in international arbitration, uh, common ways of doing things and uh so that was i it, it was not unknown the way that the, the, the procedure evolved was very much uh the, the the ways i was familiar with uh in general i was struck by uh how lively the brazilian arbitration scene is there's lots of people participating there's a lot of activity and i've seen this in these arbitrations but i've seen it on other occasions as well i mean it it struck me last time i spoke in person at a conference in in sao paulo it was at cam uh, it also was very evident when we organized the ICA uh, Congress in Rio, that's a little older, that was in 2010. There was such an interest and such a, a lively community that uh, is very impressive for people who come from sm small countries like me, you know. Yeah, that's, that's great. Uh, and uh, by working by working on these cases, did you, did you form any particular view about arbitration in Brazil? Now I have to speak under the control of all those who know it so much better than I do. That is a little risky to answer this. No, I I was struck, but I knew this from research I had done. Uh, that there is a more conciliatory approach to arbitration, at least traditionally in Brazil. And it's similar to what we have in Switzerland or in Germany is as well the same thing. Interestingly, it's the same thing in China. So, and other places that are more common law traditions, have uh, less of this uh, conciliation approach. I think if you're not mistaken in your uh, arbitration law, there's a specific provision that the tribunal must attempt to conciliate to the parties. And, and uh, that is something that was very familiar to me and would be very awkward to an English uh, arbitrator, for instance. 
Yes, it's something very common that we have usually in Brazil, not only in arbitration, but also in judicial cases that conciliation or mediation must be tried uh, before the proceeding. So that's that's very it cool. linked, actually, because if courts do it, then arbitral tribunals uh, also generally do it, at least traditionally. And, uh, and in other places where courts don't do it, arbitrators think that their only role is to settle the dispute by issuing a decision as opposed to uh, getting parties to settle. Yeah. Great. Okay, thank you. Sure. It is, it is part of our uh, tradition, I would say. This is why in, in our uh, arbitration law, we have this recommendation to the arbitrators that they try uh, to conciliate the parties or to make a mediation, which is which sounds a little awkward to foreigners because arbitrator is not a mediator, but well, the arbitrators are not going to act as mediator. And I think you have this experience in, in Brazil because you have a very famous arbitration you, you are chairing here in, in Sao Paulo, if I'm not mistaken. And it ended with a, a, a conciliation and it, it was a very, very difficult case. Um, Perhaps you were a very stern arbitrator and the lawyers were afraid of you. <laughs> so this is why they, they tried to mediate. <laughs> okay, so uh, now Gustavo is uh, making some questions about diversity. Hi, Professor Gabriel. Thanks for being with us today. It's a great pleasure to have you here. Yeah, like Professor Kamana said, my our, our third part of this interview is about diversity. It's a very challenging topic. The first question is, is this one. Did you face difficulties in your career being a female? And what was your role model to, to pursue your career considering diversity? Uh, when, when I, in my younger years in arbitration, I would really have liked to have a role model, right? Uh, someone I could look up to who would be an inspiration. But uh, but as a, as a woman, I, I saw no one with whom I could identify. And I was a woman with small children and a family to manage and a, a professional life uh, next to it. And the, the ones who, who were... Uh, specializing in arbitration didn't fit this this model so so eventually I had to decide that I had to do it my way and try to be myself and and do my best like this so uh, yeah yeah did you ask whether I had uh, difficulties in your difficulties career being familiar? Yeah. Um, yeah I certainly did and maybe I did not always realize it on the spot, but maybe later thinking back, I thought, well, maybe I was not appointed in this arbitration because I, uh, to chair this arbitration because I was a woman. But then uh, I try not to focus too much on these issues. And, and it, it is true also that uh, I have had support from, I mentioned it earlier on, but I have also had, uh, I came across uh, arbitrators who, who were uh, much more senior than I was, with whom I had the privilege of working together and they were very supportive to me and, and they helped my career. So you, you have actually both a little bit, yeah, yeah, you have to, discrimination part and the support part. Yeah. Perfect. This has changed, I think. I hope it has changed over the years. And how important do you think it is diversity of age, gender, ethnic, cultural diversity in general in international arbitration? Um, yeah, I, I think uh, it is, it is it plays a very important role in the acceptability of the uh, of uh, international arbitration as a dispute resolution mechanism. And I worked on this more in the context of investment arbitration, where 
Uh, we have uh, uh, a lot of statistics uh, about in a lot, uh, and an issue, all this issue of legitimacy of the international arbitration and diversity plays a role there. But it's it's also the it's the same in commercial arbitration. And to me, diversity is really uh, many different aspects. And I think you mentioned, um, I mean, gender of course is one, but that is that is improving. I see it improving uh, more and more with with good awareness now that uh, that uh, gender diversity uh, should be uh, promoted. But then there is also uh, regional diversity. And when I say regional, I, I use it in a broad fashion. That's, this covers race, it covers ethnicity, it covers religion, it covers culture. And uh, that still is, is there's a lot of work to be done there, I think, uh, uh, because, and I always tell my students, I, when I have students here who uh, come from all parts of the world, I say, well, it's good that you come here and learn and, and get some experience, but then go back and, and practice arbitration in your uh, jurisdiction because, because it's important that we develop more and more uh, diversity uh, regional diversity. There's age as well. Age is a little bit more complicated because obviously uh, experience requires time, which means that uh, if you take time, you get older, right? So uh, that is a little different, although I, oh, I see that there are many young people who are very good at it, uh, who are very hardworking, and sometimes I think if I were counsel, maybe I would rather that take just a big name. Uh, I would maybe take someone who's a little younger and will still prove what he's capable of doing. And, uh, and that might be a, a better deal for the party. So, so age is, is, is a factor too that should be considered more. Yeah, I was I was going to to ask specific this question about age now, but you have already answered. But just just to 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 make up my last one here, what do you think about of the appointment of younger arbitrators? And by younger arbitrators, I mean individuals in their thirties, but specific specific specifically to solve disputes that are of lower economic value. For example, maybe sometimes they can act as sole arbitrators. Do, do you think this would would be you know fine good or and do you know about any recent developments in the global context in this regard i i see this happening more and more uh because uh institutions try to appoint younger people also to renew the pool and uh i think that's good practice because it's a, a, a we have to make space. I mean, older people like we need, uh, have to make space for younger ones, and uh, and there's a, a rare longevity uh, among arbitrators, right? Which you don't find in that many professions, and uh, which which is good in some as aspects, but also uh, sometimes uh, makes it more difficult for younger people to get to appointments where they have uh, uh, serious responsibilities. So I think uh, that's a good practice and institutions do this uh, more and more, and that gives an opportunity for younger people to, to gain experience, which is often the difficult part of it is getting your first appointment to show you're capable of doing it and then the others will follow. Okay, thank you so much, Professor. Sure. And we we are, are we are trying to do this uh, in in Brazil, Gabriel. We um, there are some institutions that work with lists lists of arbitrators, and we try to put those youngsters, those that are prepared uh, in 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 this lists of this institution, so that in the low uh, low economic value cases they can work. And we are we are doing. Uh, best profit of these youngsters because they are really very, uh, well prepared. And in the, these arbitrations that are some simple, I, I would say, uh, they try to do their best. So uh, the, the, the final result is fantastic. 
uh, because they want to show they are very good and yeah, they are prepared. So uh, it's a, a good experience, uh, at, at least here in Brazil, uh, the results are, are very good. And uh, now, uh, Fabi again, uh, the arbitration, the arbitrator and the law, this is the topic, Fabi. Thank you, Professor. Um, Professor Gabriel, um, what an arbitrator should do when dealing with a law unknown to her or him, um, especially regarding your, a lot of your experience with international arbitrations? And also, if in, in this context, what is the importance of Uranov arbiter to international arbitration? Uh Years ago, I I I, I gave I, I wrote an article and I gave speeches about this, and I counted how many times I actually applied laws that I did not know, and and the vast majority of my cases were in in in, in uh, laws that I do not know. So that is certainly a specificity of arbitration compared to uh, court uh, litigation. Um, it seems to me that uh, a good legal mind can master this. Uh, you have to. You have a lot of help as an arbitrator. You have to, you have counsel submissions. You often have uh, legal experts. You have legal authorities that you have to study. You can ask questions. So. Once you have absorbed all this, I think you're you should be able to give a solution in a law that in which you are not trained. Uh, maybe what happens is maybe you miss some peculiarities or idiosyncrasies of a specific legal system and you tend to make things more uniform or more harmonized because you think in your legal system even though i don't often apply swiss law that's my basic education so maybe my references are to uh to notions in swiss law so that may be different if you it's difficult to i have tried to analyze this year years ago but it's difficult to really pinpoint to what extent an arbitral tribunal on a given legal issue in a specific legal systems gives a different decision than what a local court would do uh, in the end, I don't think it makes much of a difference, but uh, but it's still an open issue. There's this harmonization uh, thing about arbitration, uh, which comes from the fact that you have people who do not know the law and 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 reason in a more a general way. I don't know whether that hap that answers your question. Yes, no, that's perfect. And I'll jump to another one and then maybe I'll come back to an, another issue about um, Yudanov at Arbiter. Um, so uh, you've mentioned about the your interest on international, uh, transnational process and arbitration. So what do you think nowadays about the globalization of arbitration procedure? And is this a reality or a myth? Yeah, I think it's a reality. It's a fact. Uh, think about, um, for instance, think about witness statements. When I started 40 years ago, that was not at all uh, an accepted practice, right? Some arbitrators would say you have to give a witness statement. Others would not. Others would have just direct examination, like in some courts you have where the witnesses come and then you ask them just questions and then they say, yeah, I remember this or I don't remember that. Uh, today in international arbitration, we find it quite natural to have witness statements, to not have uh, long direct examinations, but just short ones and then cross examination. So I think there's a, I mean, I could give many more examples of that. So, uh, so there is, 
a clear trend uh, that is that we see and we have seen now for for a number of decades. Uh, that does not mean that everything is the same everywhere. And so, uh, when when one arbitrates in one seat uh, under one law, I would say you always have to make sure that you have read the arbitration law of the place and you're not missing something that would be important and might give rise to uh, risk of annulment. Thank you, that's perfect. And then going back to another point, uh, you have written about Euro Novet Arbiter in international arbitration. Uh, do you think that the Prague rules are good guidance concerning uh, this issue? And is this something that is accepted in international arbitration or courts around the world? Or is this is there still a resistance to Euronovit Arbiter? There, there are still differences uh, in, in legal uh, traditions. Uh, I remember that's a long time ago. I remember one co-arbitrator saying during the deliberation, well, they have not proven the law. And I was relatively ignorant at that time. And I was saying, well, they, you know, why are you saying this? They don't have to prove the law. We are the ones who apply the law. We prove the facts. We don't prove the law. But I mean, in his tradition, uh, the parties had to prove the law because the law was foreign law compared to what he knew. And so it was just natural that uh, you have to prove the law. So, uh, so there are different uh, approaches to that in court and in, in an arbitration in part, still there, there are uh, differences. Now, I, I usually have a standard provision in my initial procedural documents that say that the parties will uh, explain what the law, that what the legal rules are. And if the tribunal wants, it can do its own research into the law, but it has no obligation to do so. And, I, and that is precisely to avoid difficulties in jurisdictions where the tribunal should not venture uh, into his its own uh, investigations and but what is important i think is what matters most is that you don't surprise the parties was with the application of a rule that they didn't argue and were ha were given no opportunity uh, to comment on so i would always make sure that this is this is uh uh, th this opportunity is given to the parties if they have not pleaded something and I think it's relevant then I would ask them uh, what 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 do you think about it uh, the Prague rules I think you mentioned the Prague rules the, the difficulty with the Prague rules is that they are taking quite a, a civil law approach to international arbitration and they may be fine in certain cultural legal contexts and not in others. And when you have a real uh, a party from a civil law country, one from a more common law country, then they, they're not well ad adapted. And I think they say that the tribunal can apply a rule ex officio, a legal rule ex officio, if the arbitrators are qualified in that legal system. And, and then I also say that you have to ask the parties to comment. I, I don't think you have to be qualified in a legal system to apply a, a, a rule that the parties have not specifically pleaded because most of the time uh, you have at least one arbitrator who doesn't know that legal system. So that reduces the, the scope very much. Uh, I would rather place the emphasis on the fact that you should not surprise the parties was a rule that they didn't expect. Does that answer 
Yes, or that's perfect. It is something. Thank yes, you. Yes, it that's does. <laughs> that's good. good. Yes, it does. But, um, uh, Gabriel, we are we are dealing with a very risky system, isn't it? Because uh, let, let's suppose that we are we have to apply the uh, Swedish law, for instance. Even even if you ask the parties to prove the law, uh, you do know uh, you know uh, you don't speak Swedish, so uh, you are not going to be able to make any research and to understand exactly what the law means. So you perhaps you are going to surprise the parties at the end of the day. Perhaps you are going to apply that law in a completely different way, uh, not because you want to uh, to contradict a tribunal, for instance, but because you can understand the law. So at the end of the day, I, I think this is a very risky system. If you are going to adjudicate according to a law that you do not know, if you know the language at least, it's okay. So you're going to make your research. But if you are supposed to apply the Chinese law, by God, uh, perhaps they, you are going to, uh, to cause a, a wonderful surprise or a, 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 tra a tragedy <laughs> to the parties, I don't know. But I think in Brazil, we are discussing this, the, the, the system, and we are discussing this Uranovit Curia because it, it's part of our tradition, and uh, we don't have a conclusion. So it's very interesting to, to understand your, your position and uh, to, discuss it, uh, to discuss it later. Thank you very much for this, this opinion. And now it is uh, uh, it's Juan's time, so uh, your turn. Thank you, Professor Carmona. Thank you, Professor Gabriel, for being here today. It's a pleasure for all of us. And uh, I'd like to follow up one issue that Professor Carmona brought early today about different cultures. So Professor Carmona said uh, and commented about this issue of dealing with lawyers from different cultures. So the one million dollar question or the millions and millions of dollars question would be how to reconcile as an arbitrator working with lawyers from civil and common law jurisdictions. Um, that's one of the beauties of arbitration, right? That bridges the gaps and it merges uh, procedural cultures, and it does so not in a theoretical way, but it does so in practice. So it does so in a way that you have to reach a result, which is an award, and for that, everybody needs to work together. And you have, as an arbitrator, to make sure that the framework is such that everybody understands what is being done, that the procedure is uh, uh, predictable, that nobody has bad surprises. Many, many years ago, I, I remember I was counsel then and it was, I was, had been trained in, in New York. So it was obvious to me that it was in Switzerland uh, the, the arbitration was seated in Switzerland. It was obvious to me that I could meet the parties, the, the witnesses in advance and pre not prepare that testimony, but work on them and say, this could be a question, this could be a question. And so, and you should go back to your notes and, and please uh, refresh your recollection before you come to the hearing and so on. And, uh, my opponent was a local lawyer who had not much, had probably experience in domestic arbitration and not much in international arbitration. And at some point he made an incident and said, this is not possible. She, they know all the answers to the questions that she asks. Uh, there must be some collusion, some, conspiracy between them or so and i i said what's wrong with this right and and thanks god i had arbitrators who were familiar with the international practice and and thought that uh, that was it was nothing wrong but it shows that what you want to avoid this type of surprises and and in fact it, 
unequal treatment because the other counsel had never met with the witnesses and he had no clue what they would answer to his questions. That would have been the way you, you do it and you would have done it in court uh, in this system. But it would not be the way uh, it, it would be done in international arbitration. So these are misunderstandings that you want to avoid. And, and, and for that, you have to be aware of the differences in culture and uh, then you have to address them. And the best way is to address them straight in a straightforward manner uh, and set uh, procedural rules that are understand, uh, understood by everyone. Absolutely. And since we are from a, a civil law jurisdiction and uh, as Brazilians, we are way used to uh, commercial arbitration, so we don't have a lot of experience in investment arbitration. So you, you just mentioned about this different flavor uh, of international in, of investment arbitration. So what are, in your view, the basic differences between investment arbitrations and commercial arbitration? So what is this different flavor uh, that you just mentioned early before. A good part of the discussion that we had before about uh, not knowing the law uh, falls away in investment arbitration because, because you, you apply uh, mostly, not exclusively, but mostly uh, international law and, uh, and, and the, the treaty standards. So that, that makes a difference. Um, what, yeah, it's important in international in investment arbitration also that you have an understanding for the, uh, for the functioning of a state in legal proceeding, especially in legal proceedings, but not only, uh, because the, yeah, the state's way of handling the arbitration may involve all kinds of different ministries, agencies, uh, different authorities, central authority, provincial authorities, and the like. And that makes that will reduce its speed of action compared to a, a private actor who has a CEO, and you can ask the CEO to make the decision or the general counsel, and they will uh, make a decision. So that that is more of a practical difficulty. Um, what else is there? Um, well, there is a clear that the awards are all uh, published or practically all all published. Sometimes the proceedings are public as well. So, um, and, and one says they have no the awards have no precedential value. That's the rule. But in real fact, parties uh, argue based on uh, prior awards a lot. And so you have to consider them as a, as a tribunal. And you have always a concern that what you are saying in this arbitration will resolve this dispute, but may have unintended consequences in other, uh, for other disputes, because people will look at your award and maybe not understand it like you meant it, or it was really shaped for this case or these facts. It does wouldn't apply generally. So there's this systemic uh, um, aspect of investment arbitration that uh, makes it more complex, I would say, to 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 uh, make decisions. Because in commercial arbitration, you have two parties. They have negotiated a contract. That's a one-off contract very often, not always, but very often. And you give a ruling with respect to this contract, these parties, these facts. In investment arbitration, uh, the treaties are often have similar uh, standards or sometimes even identical language. And so uh, the issues are, are very much recurrent. I mean, what is fair and equitable treatment? What is an expropriation? And so this is always, the, these are always the same issues. Now you can say, of course, that 
the the language is not exactly the same and there's a comma there and there's a there's no comma there but but uh the general issues are the same and and therefore you're more aware of the systemic aspect i mean some arbitrators will tell you that they're not at all because they they consider their mission is just to resolve this dispute and they don't look at any other consequences that their decision may have i think that's a little bit more complicated uh, than than that because even if you don't want it people will quote your award later on so i don't know whether that answers uh, the differences i'm sure there are many others but i would have to say carter no it was really good so i couldn't agree more now I defer to Professor Carmona. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, our next uh, topic is the risk of annulment. And um, Gustavo. Professor, before moving to the risk of annulment, I would like to, to ask one more question regarding culture, the diversity of cultures in international arbitration. It's a quick, quick question. Uh, how useful, Professor Gabriel, do you think are the soft laws in arbitration? Um, there are some uh, soft laws that are extremely valuable uh, in practice. If you think of uh, especially the IBA rules on taking of evidence, they have become uh, almost hard law. Uh, but globalized hard, hard law, because even if the parties don't choose them, uh, many international tribunals would look to them when they make the decisions. Maybe the IBA guidelines on conflicts of interest are also, uh, I would not make a decision on a difficult issue of disclosure without checking there whether I should disclose or not. So uh, there are some soft laws that are very, very useful, yes. Perfect. Now moving to the risk of annulment topic. Yes. The first question would be, there is this expression very known, due process paranoia. And do you think there is a, a, a due process paranoia? This, this thing is real? Yeah, I, I don't know. When, when I conduct an arbitration, I, I never lose sight of the risk of annulment right it's always in the back of my mind when i give a ruling in a it, it, during a hearing for instance because if there is an incident i always think watch out because maybe you're now making a mistake and that could give rise to an annulment so so it's always there i, I yeah i'm not sure about the paranoia thing um there is an important um, there is an important distinction between an arbitral tribunal and a court. Right, a court has in Latin imperium. It has this. Uh, it has the backing of the state, and it can impose things on parties, whether they like it or not. An arbitrator is in a more vulnerable position. Uh, of course, there is an arbitration law that allows him to impose things. But if you want the uh, arbitration to move uh, smoothly, you somehow as an arbitrator rely on the cooperation of the party. Because if a party wants to uh, obstruct the arbitration, there's many different ways of doing it. You will nevertheless get to the award, but it may take longer and it may be more difficult. And it may be more risky in terms of annulment as well. So an arbitrator is, is naturally inclined to make sure that there is no uh, strong objection or strong resistance. If it has to come to it, then you will make a decision, if, if, even if it's unpleasant for one party. But if you can avoid it, uh, I think it's better. And is that to process paranoia or just is it a way of, of being efficient by not creating obstacles? 
um, yeah, it, probably there's a little bit of both there. Right. And in your experience, how persuasive are the parties' claims on, on risk of annulment in the tribunal's decision making? I remember one situation where I, where a party said, uh, this is a due process violation. And I said, yes, you're probably right. And I need to change this decision. And I refused you this opportunity and I'm going to give it to you. Uh, but, but that was really an exception. Usually, it's more like threats and so, and, and an experienced arbitrator knows these things. So you would, you would have to pay attention yourself and not wait for someone to tell you now you're breaching due process. Uh, avoiding breaches of due process is like a second nature, right? Uh, as an arbitrator, you, you're always paying attention to this. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor. Sure. The next stop is uh, arbitration and the future. Now uh, the crystal ball. <laughs> so, Sergio, it's your turn. Thanks. Professor Gabriele, so talking about arbitration in the future, uh, the first question is, in your experience, uh, do you think that national courts are getting to know arbitra uh, international arbitration better and have been uh, less likely to review arbitral awards? Um, yeah, I may be a little biased here because I come from a jurisdiction uh, where the courts very rarely quash an award. and. Sometimes you even think here they could have an all, then they didn't an all. And that's just because there is a philosophy that if the parties have chosen arbitration, they should be bound by it, by the pleasant and by the unpleasant consequences of their choice. So uh, that's where I come from if I think of my home jurisdiction. Now, I think you. You haven't said it. You have asked the question, but maybe there was an implied uh, implied uh, statement there. I think uh, courts uh, in the world in general understand arbitration better than they did uh, decades ago. Uh, in various places, there have been uh, specialized courts or specialized chambers set up to deal with arbitration issues. There's a lot of uh, educational effort uh, made uh, towards judges to explain, for instance, what the New York Convention is, how, what the grounds are, how it should be interpreted and things like that. And, and, and judges generally, I mean, uh, are, are very, uh, very open and, and interested in, in, in understanding this. So uh, probably we have, we have made progress in this respect over the last decades. It's also because there's more arbitration activity. So obviously these cases that may have been very rare in the past come up more often in courts. That's, that's great. It's interesting that you mentioned specialized chambers because uh, here in Brazil, uh, Sao Paulo city is one of the most common seats for, for arbitration cases. And in Sao Paulo, we have had, uh, we have specialized chambers uh, in the upper court level since about 2010. And uh, it's about five years that uh, the Sao Paulo court have created also a specialized judge in the trial court level. So we have very skilled judge to deal with this case and to deal with uh, vacation awards proceedings. And I can say by experience that it's very rare the case in which the courts in Brazil will do the awards. And in case that it happened, it's usually when it's found that an, arbitra an arbitrator uh, was biased. Uh, but just side comment. So uh, moving to the, to the second question, this talk, Professor, uh, what do you think 
uh, is the greatest, the greatest challenge for international arbitration nowadays? Yeah, that's a difficult question. Uh, I speak now of commercial arbitration, right? Um, I think efficiency is, is a time and cost efficiency is a challenge. It's not a new challenge. It's been here for a long time, uh, but uh, it's ever present and uh, we, we all need to work on being as efficient as possible. Institutions have been very uh, good at it in trying to uh, promote fast track and summary proceedings and and emergency arbitration and the like and 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 trying to uh, speed up uh, the processes. So so that but that is a challenge which we should not forget. Um, that may be also a reason why uh, slowly there's we see more mediation right and more emphasis on mediation because mediation is a very uh, very efficient uh, tool um, transparency may be a challenge to uh, in arbitration in, even in commercial arbitration and it has, that has very, uh, different facets there's this publication of awards I think that uh, we should work on more because uh, that assists the development of the law and a lot of uh, commercial law issues uh, never get to the courts and there, there are interesting solutions being worked out in, in arbitration and they are not, uh, not made public or not enough uh, made public. Uh, there's also a transparency with respect to the operation of in arbitral institutions. Depends on the countries, but in some countries, I think it would be good that uh, there is more insight into the workings of the institution because it has, uh, it, it enhances, the transparency enhances uh, good governance. And I think that's, uh, that's also important in uh, fostering the confidence in you of users in, in arbitration. Uh, and then we've already mentioned diversity, but that is another challenge that, that has to be worked on, yeah. That's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Sure. So, uh, uh, happily, we arrived to the last uh, topic of the of our interview, but this is one of the most important topics, and uh, the interviewers are very interested uh, in in your advices uh, to young uh, professionals. So, João, your questions. Thank you, Professor Carmona. So, Professor Gabriel, uh, what a huge part of our uh, uh, of the people who are watching this interview would like to know is how, or better say, what advice would you give to young professionals who are seeking a career as an arbitrator? Yeah. Um, well, first do it if you enjoy it, because we're good at what we like to do, right? And otherwise you should not do it. Um, Probably what, what is uh, useful is a good um, education um, in international arbitration, maybe also in a different legal system so that you develop a sensitivity for the fact that there are other ways of resolving or looking at things than the one you've initially been trained in. Uh, an open mind is is also important for an arbitrator. You should really keep your mind open. Do not decide too fast. Really be uh, listen. Um, hard work uh, is unfortunately difficult to to avoid because uh, uh, because. Uh, well, it's 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 the same for counsel and for arbitrators, obviously. But uh, uh, 
um, cases become more and more heavy uh, in terms of facts, in terms of uh, submissions, reports, materials. So you have to absorb all this, and that uh, that simply means work. Um, what else could I say? Maybe one should be should remain self-critical, right? And always try to to improve. Uh, there's always room for improvement. So, uh, yeah, that's what I would say. There's, I'm sure there are other things that I that that do no, not for come. Sure. To my a little bit of luck as, as well. I think it's uh, another thing to <laughs> to consider. And uh, maybe the one last question, on, on the very last question, is reg regarding submissions. So uh, written and oral arguments. We are also uh, lawyers who work in international or in, in domestic arbitrations in litigation as well. So. What tips would you give to young lawyers with regard to written and oral submissions? Um, I mean, there are no uh, magical recipes, of course, but uh, clarity uh, to me is, as an arbitrator, when I read submissions or I listen to oral argument, uh, clarity in the line of argumentation and in the way of and in expression as well it is really important. Uh, conciseness is also effective, I would say. Sometimes I have the feeling that uh, counsel uh, overestimate uh, arbitrators. They're just human beings. They can absorb so much, and after a while, they don't absorb it anymore. So, if you can be uh, effective in 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 communicating, conveying your main points, uh, and and if you can, it's not always possible. But if you can, throughout. Uh, the proceedings stick with your strategy. Uh, that uh, that is effective as well. I would say I saw some uh, very good counsel who kept saying the same three arguments, and 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 then you think, well, you know, these are good arguments rather than twenty arguments. In in and necessarily in the twenty, there's a few that are not good or are just secondary. I. I'm also impressed by people, more by people who are selective in their arguments. Now, I know you have a client behind who say, well, why did you not say this? Why did you not say that? Uh, and maybe sometimes you have to make uh, alternative arguments or subalternative arguments, but uh, it, it's, it's somehow less effective. But of course you have to have to be sure that your arguments are good if you are selective, but that that is important. In hearings, the drafting is important. That you, you're a good drafter is 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 plays a role. In hearings, uh, all of this actually goes to oral submissions as well. What I find important in hearings is uh, for for watch the tribunal, listen to the tribunal's questions, comments, watch their body language. There's a lot that you can learn about where the, where the arbitrators have difficulties, what they do not understand or where they're not sure, where they have doubts. If you capture this during the hearing, then you will be much more effective in your oral and, in, or for instance, in your post-hearing briefs. Uh, I was very impressed once by a uh, counsel who was a, a, a very senior advocate, uh, and he, he left to his younger partners all the facts and all the technical stuff. And at the end, he in his closing statement in 20 minutes, he just 
took one after the other all the questions I had on my mind and gave answers. I'm not saying these were the right answers, but obviously he had understood where the difficulties were. And, uh, and I thought that was, uh, that was very helpful. And it was uh, certainly, it doesn't mean that he will win or lose or so, that's not the point. Uh, but uh, his arguments were well understood and, and that. So listening and, and watching is something we don't learn actually. We learn how to write, we learn how to speak, but we don't learn how to listen. And, and that's an important skill as well. Uh, in arbitration, yeah. Thank you, Professor Gabriel. Uh, Professor Carmona, would you like to add something? Uh, okay, so uh, Fabi, 30 seconds to say goodbye. Thank you, Professor. Um, Professor Gabriel, it's, it's an honor to have you here, especially because you are a role model for myself. You unfortunately didn't have one, but I'm, glad and happy that you are one for myself. I could, uh, I had already the opportunity to see a few classes from you and um, you playing a, a role model in a, in a, as an arbitrator in a, in a workshop from ICA. And I could take from those experiences uh, some of your humanity and the way you address to people and, and the issues. And that's, that was something that I learned a lot. So thank you very much. And today was another opportunity that was really good. Thank you. Thank you for thanking me. <laughs> directly from New York, where he is studying uh, right now. Yeah, thank for, thanks, Professor Carmona. Professor Gabriel, it was amazing. It was not an interview, but a real class. Thank you so much. I hope you have also enjoyed. See you. Uh, Professor Gabriel just echoes uh, my colleagues' words. Uh, it's not every day that we have the chance uh, to speak with some uh, experienced arbitrator as you. And we learn from the books, we learn from the classes, but we learn a lot from personal experiences such great practitioners as you. Thanks, thanks a lot. It's hard to be the last one, but uh, <laughs> I just would like to <laughs> highlight all of the words from my colleagues. It's such an honor to have you today. And we take your piece of advice for, I don't know, uh, years and years since today. Uh, it's really, really good to follow your tips and we hope to see you soon, maybe as an arbitrator or as a, an opposing counsel, who knows. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks to you. Well, uh, really uh, a wonderful opportunity, a real masterclass, and uh, we enjoyed it a lot. And uh, well, I, uh, I look forward to uh, meeting you in Switzerland or in Brazil. Uh, as soon as we are free to travel again. So <laughs> let's hope for the best, okay? Thank you so much. This was a real pleasure for me. And I, I do hope that I can see you in person in a too distant future. And I would be very happy to come back to, to Brazil. So uh, thanks to all of you and to all those who are listening, of course, as well. Thank you very much. Goodbye.